Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, I should say, welcome to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Today is Saturday, June 11th, uh, 2022. And I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director. I'm joined by Gail Hughes, who's our book club coordinator, uh, and also Drea Bergman, who manages all of our programs and campaigns. And there's also a collection of, of uh, board of directors and, and other folks here as well. So today is our final session, reading The Politics of World Federation by Joseph Barada. And we've been fortunate to have Joseph here for the entire exploration into the history of our movement. So today we'll be focusing on the conclusion uh, to his book and Appendix F, uh, which, uh, which focuses on world federalist declarations. Uh, we'll proceed as usual with Joseph pointing out what he feels are the highlights and main takeaways from those chapters. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. I'll ask everybody, if you're not already on mute, to please go on mute at this time and remain on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and um, yeah, so we don't hear all the background noise and all that stuff. Um, you're welcome to use the chat feature uh, in Zoom, but we won't be monitoring it for questions or comments. So you can still use that to communicate with each other. And we'll stop at about 10 minutes or so before the end of the session for any announcements that people might have about relevant events or things they wanna promote. Uh, so we ask everybody to hold those comments until the end. Um, we also will have information um, at the end about our next reading, um, as well as the one month break we're about to go into. So we'll talk about that at the end as well. And um, if a latecomer joins the session and we don't recognize their name, we may kind of stop the show for a moment and just ask them to identify themselves uh, to prevent Zoom bombing, uh, which we've been lucky to avoid so far. So uh, with that as the entree, let me turn it over to Joseph. You have the floor. Joseph, do you hear me? Well, where are you? <laughs> looks like he's frozen. Joseph? He looks frozen. I think uh, he's frozen. I think I'm going to go upstairs and check. <laughs> thank oh, okay. You, Virginia. Yeah, no, thank his you, eyes Virginia. are moving. His eyes are moving, but there oh. may be a problem with the sound. Um, yeah, Virginia, that'd be great if you can check. He was on before. Yeah, yeah, we were speaking fine, and his vi his video is coming through fine. But okay, well, we, l luckily we have a live-in <laughs> there, so uh, we can uh, handle it that way. He might have lost our picture and sound. Yeah. Okay. I just uh, give it a second for Virginia to get upstairs and check. Oh, here I am. Oh, terrific. Yeah, Welcome. Now, uh, sorry, I... <clears throat> One of the lessons I've learned about computers is uh, leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, greetings, everybody. Uh, I will draw my own conclusions drawn from our discussions, as well as from the chapter that I distributed the uh, uh, final chapter in my book on conclusions. And then I will invite all of you, each of you to state your own conclusion. I started my book in the 1970s, continuing through the 80s, when the Cold War was at its peak. I could not see how the historical trends could end other than in a war to the finish between the United States and the Soviet Union. No alternative vision than the destruction of communism seemed to be before us. So I wrote the book in defiance of what conventional historians said was reality. Working alone and admitting to myself that I had no power other than to tell the truth, I uncovered the scattered record of what increasingly appeared to have been a rather substantial World Federalist Movement of 1939 to 1950 
and up to the present and to write up a documented critical history that could stand up to public examination. I aimed mainly to get a book published that might get into large university and public research libraries like Yale or New York so that if war came, perhaps a few copies might survive. I hope the book might help the survivors to do better next time. I did write the book to be easy to read and popular on such a theme as lasting world peace, but this hope proved to be disappointed. The publisher set a price of $130 for a two volume book, which of course priced it out of the popular market. One of the things I learned was that the World Federalist Movement had many origins. There was Clarence Streit, who proposed a union of democracies whose preponderance of force would overawe the fascist states and thus prevent World War II. The US State Department's Advisory Committee on Post-War Foreign Policy toyed, according to the Harley Nodder record, with the alternatives of federation or international organization until the Moscow Conference of 1943. Grenville Clark was in Henry Stimson's War Department and both men sensed that the age when nations could protect themselves by, by preparedness for war was passing. The ultimate aim had to be in Stimson's words the necessary government of the whole. Winston Churchill offered British Union with France on 14 June 1940, just before her defeat by Nazi Germany, which was an inspiration for the later European community and hence now the European Union. When atomic bombs were first used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic scientists filled with grief at what modern science had contributed to war, mobilized to advocate the international control of atomic energy and some a world government to prevent a nuclear arms race and inevitable nuclear war. Intellectuals at the University of Chicago under Robert M. Hutchins and G.A. Borgesa set to work to draft a model world constitution to end the age of nations and to achieve both peace and justice. A popular movement of lawyers, scientists, veterans, journalists, educators, teachers, students, and a few politicians, not too many leaders in business or labor, led by British MP Henry Osborne and publicists like Norman Cousins, built a World Federalist Movement of some 72 organizations in 22 nations with a peak individual membership of 101,000 persons in 1951. In the United States, such groups introduced 16 World Federalist Resolutions in Congress. And there were hearings on the fundamental objective of US foreign policy in 1948, 49, and 50. Hence, one of the lessons of history that I take away is that the idea of World Federation will recur even if citizens for global solutions and all of us are overcome by events like war with Russia or the loss of democratic government in America. If there is a general failure of the sovereign state system, if alliances and balance of power and international organization fail, men and women will look around and ask, what now can save us? What is adequate to our global problems? The logical answer, not that history moves by logic, is that it must be a government. 
as in the creation of the United States under the federal constitution in place of the failed Articles of Confederation. The European Union, neither simply a federation of states and peoples nor a confederation of states is probably the most practical example. But some novel form of international government democratically representative and constitutionally limited that can enact the rule of law reaching to individuals will necessarily be the essential solution. There is no peace without justice, no justice without law, no law without government. There are 1,000 steps from the present international anarchy to the future popular federal government of the whole of the globe. Five books show the way forward. Augusto Lopez Claros, Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. Joe Leinen and Andreas Bummel's A World Forum. The Stimson Centers, Beyond UN 75, a roadmap. Joseph Schwartzberg's Transforming the United Nations System. And my own history, The Politics of World Federation. The first four books cite me and each other. They are the ones that today show the way forward. Why did the World Federalists appear in history? Because the former form of international government, the League of Nations, failed to keep the peace. Woodrow Wilson was the great innovator, and then the United States of America failed to join the League. World War II was a revelation of the anarchy of sovereign states. It was a reversion to barbarism when humanity could not summon the intelligence and will to establish a good government of the whole. Then in the course of the war, the democracies, liberal and socialist, were effectively allied 125 million people from around the globe were put in un allied uniform. 29 million in the Axis, 60 million of the general population perished and countless millions more were focused on one purpose, victory over fascism. Even the atomic bomb revealed the immense powers put into the hands of humanity for good or evil. Survivors in the democracies felt confident that they could keep the peace and they tried to make the United Nations organization all that they had won by the war work or to reform it like the World Federalists. Why did the World Federalist Movement fail? My history shows that the World Federalists were defeated, not because their ideas of government were mistaken, but because the Cold War, led by nationalist statesmen like Joseph Stalin and Harry Truman, developed soon after victory in Europe and Japan. Hence, I must ask you to bear in mind the many references to Cold War events like the Truman Doctrine or the Korean War, which inexorably broke down public enthusiasm for more fundamental solutions to the problem of peace than rearmament, universal military training, and leadership in nuclear and conventional arms races. The North Atlantic Treaty and NATO were only temporary expedients I did not write a contentious book critical of US policy, for I wanted to present a positive vision of peace, which has been so lacking in my country all my life. The book that in my judgment best expresses a comprehensive history of the Cold War is D.F. Fleming, The Cold War and Its Origins, 
1917-1960. Fleming starts by recommending that readers read first Robert Sherwood's Roosevelt and Hopkins, 1948. It reveals the wiser US policy that was lost by FDR's early death. If the Cold War was the cause of the decline of the World Federalist Movement, what happened when the Cold War ended? Say, when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Ah, how we all hoped. After a short period of international accord and gratitude to Mikhail Gorbachev, followed by another of American triumphalism, led by the two presidents Bush, international affairs soon reverted to their anarchic pattern. Hence, we learned that the problem all along was not US or Soviet foreign policy, but the absence of effective institutions of world law. Jean Monnet, the father of the European Union, used to say that for the hard work of uniting sovereigns, sovereignties, Humanity will not act without a crisis. Thomas Jefferson said the same thing. All experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than they are to right themselves by changing the forms to which they are accustomed. It is true that a crisis like the advent of atomic bombs will be needed to move humanity to establish some form of world government. The federal form seems most immediate since it preserves diversity within union, subsidiarity. But apparently the threat of nuclear war, economic depression, ecological collapse, new pandemics, terrorism from the global south, and all the problems of the global problematique are not enough to move humanity to undertake the political revolution to bring these problems under control. What is needed is such a breakdown in the sovereign state system that large numbers of people lose faith in their national governments Probably I fear it will take another great war, which leaves America, Russia, Europe, and China so devastated that leaders will arise to start the beginnings of a popularly representative world republic. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Hebrews 12. The discovery of life elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy might bring us to our senses sooner. We will have to unite to present ourselves to the Galactic Council. Further progress of science, like a unified field theory in physics or emergence in biology, offers more hope, I contend, than ecumenicism in religion. Perhaps the James Webb Space Telescope will give us a new perspective on the origin of things. At the United Nations, use of religious symbols or quotation of religious doctrines is forbidden for the regrettable reason that religions are still engaged in contests for supremacy. The organized historic religions are not adapting to the changed global environment fast enough. Despite humanity's hunger for spiritual existence, as world historians H.G. Wells and Arnold Toynbee found. As the Quakers say, the age of prophecy has not ended. We need a new theology. How many people today could say we are ready for World Federation? I think millions, if not billions. They are the ones who already work in international businesses, who travel abroad eagerly, 
who serve in civil society organizations, bringing aid to the poor and unfortunate, who are linked in the universal cause of science, who are engaged in scholarship and education that crosses borders, who care about the international news, who show extraordinary sympathy for the victims of continuing wars, who bring in refugees and the downtrodden, who as soldiers have been disillusioned with national use of force. These millions cherish the promise of human rights in all lands. They are ready to perform their duties as well as to enjoy their liberties under governments guaranteeing universal human rights. Further conclusions can be drawn from my last chapter and from the appendix recalling historic World Federalist declarations. The rule of law at the state level is well established. The rule of world law is still a dream. There are precedents for world federalism in the 30 national federations established since the United States in 1787. Also in the 37 clauses in state constitutions providing for delegation of sovereign powers to a higher union. Atomic fear proved too weak to move people to world union in the 40s. National leaders used such fears to move people back to traditional solutions like military preparedness and peace through strength. A positive vision is needed. People must want a world federal government as the guarantor of their liberties and security. They must want a good world government. It is true that world community must precede world government, but even if the beginning is cautious and guarded, government helps to create community. <clears throat> As the history of the United States and most other federations shows. But caution is needed. Some of those federations like the USSR, Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia have spectacularly failed. Humanity had more time after Hiroshima and Nagasaki to establish world government than five years. The assumption was that after the Soviets developed atomic bombs, a nuclear world war would become inevitable. One world or none as a slogan of desperate urgency now sounds foolish and hysterical. It led cold warriors to accuse the world federalists of atomic jitters. There was a middle way between world war and world government. World Federation requires lots of time. The historic World Federalists formed too late in 1947 to have an appreciable effect on national policy. Their historic opportunity when world politics was in flux, as Ambassador William Bullitt said, was in 1942-43 or a bit later as the new UN began work and immediately proved wanting, say by 1947. The movement must be organized before the historic opportunity passes. The end of the Cold War was another opportunity, but the movement was exhausted and dispirited. Fifty million adherents to United World Federalists, as radio announcer Raymond Graham Swing envisaged, was about the right order of magnitude to make world federalists respectable on the national and even world stage. 
If UWF had been that popular, it could not be said by mainstream historians or political commentators today that world federalists did not amount to a hill of beans. The political process of the transition was barely begun by sending a sophisticated lawyer with international experience like Robert Lee Humber into every state legislature and winning passage of a World Federalist Resolution in the final rush of legislation shortly before adjournment. Similarly, with the introduction of non-binding sense resolutions in Congress, compared to the binding Vandenberg Resolution of the, on the North Atlantic Treaty at the same time. The public must learn what is going on. The press must help articulate the question. The legislature must be engaged in open debate. And finally, the real test beyond Gallup polls, politicians must run for office on the issue of World Federation. Henry Wallace and Henry Osborne barely fit this bill. Something like Franklin Roosevelt's campaigns against the economic royalists, against the forces of selfishness and lust for power will be needed. The later teaching of the World Federalist was that the containment policy, the North Atlantic Treaty and NATO were only temporary expedients pending the day when serious efforts could be made to establish peace on the basis of the necessary government of the whole. As Henry Stimson said, Grenville Clark, his associate, became the most articulate former government official to expound what he called minimal world government limited to the abolition of war. His book, World Peace Through World Law, co-written with Harvard international lawyer, Louis B. Sohn, is a sustained examination of how the United Nations might be reformed to make it effective at keeping the peace in a disarmed world. Among the several approaches to World Federation, the unofficial revolutionary approach of Henry Osborne to elect delegates to a People's World Constitutional Convention, which he had the misfortune to schedule for December 1950 in Geneva, proved a fiasco. There were only three elected delegates from segregationist Tennessee and they refused to recognize the credentials of an African anti-colonialist patriot from Nigeria, Iwo Ita. It is true that a world union would have to be based on the sovereignty of the people, but a gradual approach is surely wiser. Loosening the people's bonds to their national governments before there is a world federal government to secure them could lead to hell, as Scott Buchanan said. Better to follow the precedent of Philadelphia in 1787, when the states sent delegates to deliberate on a more perfect union. That, of course, presupposes Republican virtue and honor at a time of world crisis. A working union of peoples, as opposed to an association of states, must be based on liberal democracy first, history concludes. Any elements of socialist democracy would have to be added to that foundation, as in mixed economies everywhere today. Clarence Streit on this point proved right. Grenville Clark and United World Federalists, who sanguinely assumed the workability of Communist Party members in a world legislature, history shows were mistaken. Anarchy is not the sole cause of war. 
putting equality before liberty, communist government enforcing social equality before liberal governments protecting individual freedoms and national independence also proved another. Anti-communism during the Cold War did preserve American liberties, which at least made a small step toward permanent peace. The great problems for World Federation were membership, representation, powers, and transition. In their deep struggles over principle, a certain resolution of these problems developed in the articulate public by the end of the Cold War. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party, it became conceivable, at least for a few years, that the West might unite with Russia. Those who envisaged a universal union and those who demanded democracy before union effectively merged. On powers, virtually all workers in the field of international organization now speak not only of security against war, but also of economic development and social justice. So it could be said that the advocates of maximal powers have prevailed. On representation, weighted voting, as in the Bretton Woods institutions, seems more practical than jumping immediately to proportional democracy, one person, one vote. Though it is not so offensive to democratic values as the big five veto. As for the transition, the People's Convention, unguided by national leadership, has been utterly discredited. The gradual UN reform approach is the only one viable by popular pressure and someday by associations of parliamentarians as advocated by Democracy Without Borders. <clears throat> Global governance as a term for the goal of world policy, I regard as an evasion. Did the founding fathers propose to create a strong national governance? But global governance is a currently acceptable term since world government scares everybody practically to death. Sounds like the national security state. Global governance is that degree of voluntary international cooperation that is attainable without world government. It is the basis of the United Nations. It is what we have now, the status quo. World Federation is revolutionary. It would end the external sovereignty of states. It would unite the sovereign powers of the states and peoples in a common government. It would treat all peoples as world citizens equal before the laws. In return for promising them their liberties as human rights, it would demand of them their duties to participate in the making of the world laws and hence by their consent to obey the laws. This is exactly what the United States and other federations did at the founding. All that would change is the extent of the polity. As Harris Wolford, founder of Student Federalists once said, Federalists should wake up to discover that they would have stumbled upon mankind's greatest peaceful revolution. It is the revolution to establish politically the brotherhood of man. As I conclude in my book, the unity slowly being forged out of diversity in the future will probably be as novel 
in comparison to the historic national federations as the federations were to the confederations and monarchies that preceded them. The European Union, not strictly a federation of peoples nor a confederation of states is probably the best model. I once distributed a short document entitled Achievements, which supplants these conclusions. I am not going to take time to go over carefully the World Federalist Declarations and Appendix E, F, but I invite you to examine them. Dublin, United World Federalists, World Federalist Movement, Chicago Committee. I regard the declarations as the most lasting achievements of the World Federalist Movement. They enshrine the principles. Now, I would like to go about the meeting and ask each of you, what conclusions do you draw about the historic World Federalist Movement? If you just cannot come to a conclusion, ask another question. Okay, so, so um, Joseph, to do that and, and save time, I'll just go across my screen and call on people because if we wait for person after person, that takes a lot of time in between. So I'll just run through the screen. You may not be seeing them in the same order that I do. So if people you know, see that I'm not following their order, it's, be it's because of that. If you don't have a, um, you know, a statement, as, as Joseph said, you're free to ask a question at that time. So in the upper left-hand corner, I see Ron Glossip. So everyone could take themselves off mute now so we don't have to wait for that. Um, so Ron, do you have a um, conclusion that, that you came away from this or a question? I think that politicians need to pay more attention to language. The fact that we had the English language in the United States uniting us is a factor that's also often ignored. I don't know why the Esperantists don't seem to be able to pay much attention to politics and the politicians are not able to pay much attention to language, but I think we got to do it together. We have to have a world government, but we also have, have to have a world language. And I believe that Esperanto is the solution to that problem. Thank you. Joseph, do you want to comment on, on the comments that people make, or should I go right through? I, I think we get it. You should go right through. We need to Terrific. hear more variety. Terrific. Great. Okay, great. So moving right along, Carla May, I see you next. I would just like to uh, say that I know Joseph has indicated that um, the ecumenical angle is, is not successful, but I would like to just suggest that I think we underestimate the fact that the religions of the world are going to be involved in August in their, uh, their either ninth, if I've lost count, Parliament of World Religions, which gathers based from all over the world in discussion. I think we underestimate the fact of what religious affiliation listening to another does to move the deepest values of people. I don't think it's a quick fix, but I think it's something to watch. Great. Thank you, Carla May. Um, David Orton, I see you next. I don't know if you could hear me because I don't see your screen, but oh, you um, went off mute. Take it yeah. away. Let me just say that that parliament will be in 2023, not this year, Carla. Okay. 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 And yes, thank you. Yeah. And David, did you have either a question or kind of a summary comment of your takeaways from the entire session? Um, no, um, I pass. Okay, yeah, that's allowed too. That's another option. Um, Donna? I was really struck by the statement, humanity will not act without a crisis. And I think we do have a crisis upon us. It is the environment, the global environment is, we are at a crisis and the young people know it. And I think it is time that us old people, I'm so glad to see one or two young people, at least one, Emily looks very young with us, <laughs> Andrea, Andrea's too. Anyway, I mean, we have a crisis. I also love 
Joseph pointing out who is ready. I, we often talk about who is our audience. I think our, we should start with people who are ready, those who work in international businesses and travel globally and work in science and, and education and who are sympathetic to refugees and victims of war and soldiers who are disillusioned. I mean, I, I think he spelled out, and, and I would add to that, the young people who know we're in crisis environmentally. So, um, and I also the idea that a positive vision is needed. We have a positive vision. I just want to thank Joseph for re-energizing me once again. Um, and uh, anyway, that's my, I, that's enough for me. Okay, uh, Gail. Um, I, I was struck in the reading that in the past, the public was deemed not ready because there wasn't enough, um, um, you know, people didn't consider themselves to be global citizens. I think now, you know, since the um, implementation of the uh, internet and a lot more travel, international travel included, I think that may have changed dramatically, perhaps dramatically. And I'm thinking perhaps um, the public is ready for global governance at this point. Um, the other thing that struck me was that um, I wonder whether, I mean, there is the WHO is proposing a, there's a proposal for um, pandemic preparedness um, that, um, you know, countries are being asked to sign on to. And if that passes, then um, you know the, the WHO would do all this work to to get information and and um, prepare a plan for when a pandemic hits. Um, and and the, the difference between that and the UN is that there is a way to implement it, namely through sanctions. They're prepared to implement sanctions against countries who sign on to the treaty who don't adhere to the, their proposals. My concern about it is that the WHO is not democratically structured and not democratically run. So, you know, we're in favor of a democratic world federation, but I'm thinking we need to focus on the democracy part rather than on the World Federation part, perhaps. Because if we have a WHO that is not democratic, imposing sanctions and you know, lockdowns and mandates and so on, um, this could not necessarily, I mean, it may not be a good thing. So I just want to raise that for consideration. Thank you, Gail. David Gallup. Yeah, so I think um, what I've taken away from all of these uh, discussions of the politics of World Federation is that maybe we shouldn't be focusing so much on the institutions and politics of World Federation um, to gain interest, but that we need to build an intellectual and an emotional attachment to this concept of world citizenship. And I think uh, Professor Verrata mentioned that we need to build that idea of of a world community or build the idea of, of world citizenship. Since that's sort of been my life's work for the past 30 years, it, it certainly resonates with me. And, and so I, you know, I'm saying what we shouldn't maybe do as much as the review the institutions and politics or be studying institutions and politics or promoting that, but moving towards this idea of world citizenship. And I think the way that, that we really need to move towards that is, is the youth. And Donna mentioned this already. Um, and I'm so excited about our world citizen clubs uh, and the help that Dre has been giving me for that. So I, I really am optimistic, uh, despite all the maybe the um, weight on our shoulders to try to make the, the, you know a change in people's minds in the world. I'm really optimistic that that by getting to to young people today, we can make this change that we need. Okay, thank you, Simon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as we heard. The uh, only successful uh, political union in the world has been the European Union. 
of 27 countries. There were 28. Britain, unfortunately, exited quite unwisely. And um, it, is a com it is a sort of a union where people can exit if they want at this stage, a little short of federation where cannot, they cannot exit. So I think if we collaborate, the Citizens for Global Solutions, if we collaborate in the Los Angeles chapter, in the USA chapter, in the world chapters, we can extend the European Union to a world union by working together, getting the ideas of each person who is interested in extending the European Union to a world union <clears throat> and make it a success. As the European Union has been a success, and they received the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2012 because of their ongoing success since 1949, after a crisis of the Second World War. And as mentioned, there are many crises going on today in all aspects of things, uh, all over the world. And if we could collaborate ourselves here in Citizens for Global Solutions, we could work with the European Union and, and see if we could persuade them to extend and add the remaining 193 countries of the world to the 27 countries to make it a world union. And we will be successful by working together for justice, for harmony, for peace, for equality, for community, for integration of character, further education, training people uh, who don't have any idea about this, uh, uh, and, and being their teachers and their trainers uh, and uh, make it a success. And I believe we can. Success is better than failure. We have failed so far, but we can succeed at last working together. And I'll be happy to lead this. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Drea. Um, I just want to reiterate with agree 100% with Gail, Donna, and David said about, um, you know, there is a lot of hope. And I do think that there's broader support and there's a lot of people that we can we can gather into the fold now. Uh, when I focus on politics and especially American politics, I get pretty discouraged, especially after watching the hearings this week and knowing um, uh, what's going on and then the continued attack on human rights and women's rights. Uh, I'm not hopeful when I think about politics, but I am when I am around young people and I am when we are gathered in um, spaces where we can really be hopeful and dream and um, take action together. And that's really what uh, we need to focus in is how, how can, and I love Donna what you said, who's ready now and how can we grab those people that are ready now? And that's really the work. And if we have this huge, huge group of young people, we can actually make strides and do this. I mean, and that's what gives me hope. So again, every time I focus on the politics, especially this week is especially somber. Um, it, it really tears me down and I really want to focus on, we need a hopeful message and we need people, young people to come together. And I do think that's possible. Okay. Thank you, Drea. Tom Hastings. Huh. I'm usually an optimist, and unfortunately, I'm, <clears throat> I've, I've lost <clears throat> my optimism. And I'm, <clears throat> so I don't really <clears throat> have an encouraging uh, message. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm watching, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm discouraged. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful for uh, the book to this this time and uh, learned a lot, but I'm still 
have lost the fire that I had for World Federation. Sorry to say, that's it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Shirley, oh, I'm sorry, Lee, Lee, I'm sorry. Just staring at your name there. Well, following Rhea, I don't think I've been around young people enough because, uh, you know, I, at my age, I don't interact enough with young people. And I found the book um, discouraging. Underst the book to me revealed there's been an awful lot of people who put their lives into promoting this idea and, and not much has come, come of it. So um, I'm discouraged more than I was. But following up on Donna's uh, uh, speech, I think that we're gonna have to have a, a bigger crisis than we have now. And it may come when um, enough of global warming has raised the level of the ocean and all of our big cities that are on the ocean are flooded and immigration will become such a horrendous, we think it's bad now, immigration, but when the people who live on the coast of the world have to find new places to live, that's gonna be a, a huge, huge crisis. And maybe that will be the thing that will uh, enable leaders of the world to think think anew at having a government, a world government. In the meantime, what do we do? What, what should we be doing in the meantime? And that's where I'm left. I, I want to do something with the rest of my life and I'm not sure what that is, but I'm hoping that I can work through CGS. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Virginia. So I had the great privilege of being married to this man, Joseph Barada, for 30 years. And um, we were brought together by God, I believe, because we, we see things very differently. And I see, I think that's really important that we do because we learn from each other. My, my life is committed to world community, the prior step that Joseph mentioned to world government. I have an ability to mobilize people. Joseph has the ability to think through things that are politically um, very important. And I just want to mention one theological document that you may, may have overlooked. It's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think that it's really important that we look at what we have and what we've missed. I've often been funded in my 30 years at the UN. We have 50 years between us, by the way, at the UN. And we believe that the UN actually can be reformed. <clears throat> we, and we know that a lot of people have given up on it, but I actually listen for openings all the time. And there's one document, I'm sorry, one video that I'm trying to circulate from the Stimson Center that shows all the other organs that are prepared to take over from the Security Council. And I think we, you should really listen to that uh, video. <clears throat> but I'll just say in, in closing that Joseph and I really are important um, in the sense that we are so different and we respect each other deeply from that difference. And But we each have a, a piece of the puzzle and everyone here has a piece of the puzzle. And that's what we need to really focus on. How do we work as a team when, when there's so many different opinions? Thank you, Virginia. Emily. Thank you so much, Dr. Barada and Virginia. Um, I, I, there are so many wonderful and important things that you said. And I, I guess the first thing that came to mind was I just really appreciated you talking about um, echoing Donna, I really appreciated the, the focus on what is needed as, as a positive vision of peace and the sense that really it requires grappling with and, and kind of catalyzing the energy of crisis rather than collapsing into crisis. And I just, for me, I think that 
thinking more through that, we really need to be responding with a sense of non-reactivity in the midst of crisis instead of reactivity. And I, so I loved um, your mention of, you know, starting with who is ready, starting with young people and all the other people around the world who are ready, because I do believe um, I went to an international school and I, I really do believe that there are many, many people, um, not just in that sphere, but all over the place. Um, and I, I think just focusing on taking action together. I also, I wanted to echo um, what you said, David, about the building an intellectual attach, attachment to world citizen and the idea of building world citizenship. It kind of reminded me of um, Gramsci, the philosopher who talks about that and the need to create kind of an intellectual movement forward mm -hmm. um, as well as kind of from the ground up. So yeah, thank you so much for all your thoughts and your book. It's wonderful to read it. Thank you, Emily. Barat. Well, it's uh, difficult for me to think in terms of few sentences. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is uh, uh, moving all over. First of all, I want to be, I want to thank uh, Professor Joseph Barado. Uh, you have really stimulated me to think in uh, terms that I hadn't uh, considered uh, possible. But I'm also somewhat disillusioned in, in that uh, I think in the beginning in one of the talks you said it may be another 600 years or 300 years before we can uh, hope to have a world federation. I know none of us is are gonna be alive at that time. So to that extent, uh, this idea of a world federation, is that just going to remain a dream for us? Uh, or can we actually touch into its uh, uh, being? Uh, and, and I guess you did point out a number of uh, examples and opportunities and obviously with the contemporary world where we are so well connected through media, through electronic devices, through cultural exchanges. And I think to some extent, there's a great role for the arts, the music and the cultural values and some of the faith elements. Like we have an experiment going on in the Twin Cities areas here where multi-faith organizations have come together and are you know, creating the sense of an awareness of uh, who we are. Uh, but I worry about the fact that so much of the world is not really part of this on this stage. That's the world of poverty. That's the world of hunger. That's the world of uh, uh, you know, indigenous peoples. It, it's the world of... Uh, 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 well, the uh, countries, India, uh, China, and all these large populations, uh, what sort of input do they have right now in making a world where we all think of ourselves as citizens of the world or the people of the earth? Uh, I love the idea that you mentioned about that just as we love our nation, we need to love the earth. We need to love as, as, you know, and to how we create that must come from our cultures. And so I think there needs to be uh, a, a deeper sense of sharing of our histories and our cultures and so on and exchanges. International business and all does all that, but it does it at a very level at a level that kind of doesn't touch the, the ordinary person. 
And I'm kind of, I like to end by just reminding people of something that I know uh, Gandhi, for example, told the politicians when India was becoming independent. And he was asked, you know, what, what uh, advice or wisdom would you, do you have for us? So he said, well, when you come to situations where you have to have tough decisions to make, think of the poorest of the poor that you have ever seen and put him in that position. And how do you think he would respond or she would respond to that situation? Perhaps that'll give you an insight into how you should act. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bharat. Okay. And thank, thank you, Bharat. Um, Evan. Yeah, hi. Um, I think the challenge for those of us in the World Federation movement is the development of a consciousness of world community. And uh, that the, the uh, um, have to um, spread recognition that um, there, there is an ontological reality of people, each uh, of us grounded in our own cultural diversity everywhere. And however people are constituted, they have a right to consideration and inclusion. Now, uh, this, uh, I think if, if this is recognized and I think it will be with the levels of communication and interaction that we have in the world these days, then there is a necessity for the way for the the uh, uh, adjudication of equities of everyone to be uh, 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 established. Now, short of warfare, I might add. Um, that, so this this will require uh, working together and. Uh, uh, agreeing on ways that uh, things can be worked out. I guess that's uh, <clears throat> getting back to the idea of a workable world. Um, so the thinkers that we have been studying in this book group have established connections that impact our own perceptions and viewpoints. And that we, we need to share these much more broadly and hopefully uh, generate the consciousness that will enable um, a world, uh, uh, people to come together in a world community and establish the institutions that enable them to work things out. Thank you, Evan. Uh, Cassandra. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, basically, basically, uh, I just need more time to process all of this. So I need more time to review it. I need more time to ponder it and process it. But I do want to say I am very, very grateful that uh, Dr. Beretta shared his book with us and shared uh, his time with us. And I definitely am going to look at it closer and and process it because I think there's a lot of valuable information in there and in particular for the people who were discouraged by reading it I would say um, if you know what went where things went sideways <laughs> we have a blueprint of how things went before so that gives us information that we could devise new strategies and new ways of approaching the problem. So I think it's marvelous. So thank you much, Dr. Right. Beretta. Thank you, Cassandra. Melanie. Well, my goodness, first of all, with a big, huge thank you for Joseph, because um, this has been so interesting. I love the 
book, author, a combo, so much. And, and Joseph, not only, I mean, the way that you speak, the way that you, your emotion comes out, the way that you care so much, so deeply, so deeply about this really comes through. And I've just loved every minute, every one of these gatherings. And as far as um, being discouraged by the book, I think Whenever we feel uh, uh, that you know stuck or 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 you know, it's basically how we're looking at it. It's just a, an ad, you just need an ad, what's called an attitude adjustment. Um, we're pe the people here know something special. We know something great, and um, and I love what Virginia said about you know, we do have different takes. We have, a, everybody's got a little something that, you know, uh, the Iran with language, everybody has something that they put in, David with world citizenship, Melanie with world citizenship, you know, it's, everyone's got their little thing that they hold on to the most, but respecting each other's opinion, knowing we're part of this community, and then, and taking our minds into the idea that we do belong to this group. There is a group called world citizenship, group or or there is a group called world federalist group or there is a group called humanity we're all part of humanity and everybody in the world you know if you're human you're part of the humanity group so hey you're in and so now okay well we've got all sorts of systems all over this group there's tons of way of do tons of ways of doing things in fact there's apps coming out and people doing it already where they're working with their their local community, okay, buy nothing. It's an app where you meet your neighbor. I have this, you want it? Oh, I just gave a fence to somebody and they gave it to their neighbor. They gave me a pot, you know, all these, we're all working together. So here we have uh, this, this beautiful thing going on. Um, and there's certain problems that our community is facing. This community of humanity, of one world is facing. And so don't forget our power. You may, uh, whatever age you are, it doesn't matter. It's not up to the youth to do this. It's up to everybody who's alive now living to make it a better space. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be just helping your neighbor. It could be anything. It's that idea that we're in this together. And if you are, and I do recommend, um, learning about Dr. Rian Eisler and the history of partnership, the fact that there are examples of when this society has worked better because we all collaborated. You know, let's focus on things that, that, that worked and uh, move towards that. And remember, we're all part of this. We're all, it's all, all of us, you know, we're, if you're alive, participate, enjoy, the way that you want to participate and um we can do this absolutely so i'll pass it on okay thank you melanie and i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly it is it alimi or alimi hello hi everyone hi yeah my name is alimi thank you professor barata for you know your book and i'm glad to be here although this is just i'm joining lately and thank you gail for you know inviting me to the you know book club no there has been a lot of readings and you know it's opened my mind to a lot of things and i think i'm more optimistic you know about you know having a kind of world federation because you know, this century is the century of the youth, and we, the youth, are interconnected everywhere, and we have the technology that connects us. So I believe the time is right to push the momentum and you know do what Henry Wallace and others failed to do in the 1940s. So I guess something like Youth for Global Solution Fellowship can come up, and you know we build the momentum in you know virtually every country in the world and you know we can just before you know it reach the united nation as we have done with the you know voice of the youth at, by the passing of resolution on the you know youth at the 
General Assembly of the United Nations. So these are the things that the youth are capable of doing. And I believe the moment is right now to you know, move forward with the agenda of you know, world government. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So um, I'm last in line. So, um, but before I, I go, I just want to, um, I was remiss by not welcoming the new people that joined us today. So Alami, thank you for reminding me about that. Um, so yes, so welcome if you're just joining us and in a few moments or a little beyond that, we'll be talking about the next book and what we'll be getting into there. So, so just to uh, respond, I'll, I'll say that, you know, executive, uh, as executive director of this organization, um, my job is to move the needle forward and, and, and try to advance the cause of World Federation. So really every conversation I have, every book that I read, every sentence I read, my mind is going, can I use this, you know, or how can I use it? Um, so in reading the last chapter, um, a couple of things came to mind. Um, First, as far as, um, you know, Joseph, you're pointing out the whole array of crises, whether it's the environment, pandemics, nuclear weapons, that that hasn't gotten us together. So to that, I would say you don't have to worry because they're all going to get worse. So, um, so we, we haven't missed an opportunity. I mean, we've missed many opportunities, but it's almost, I mean, I would say it is guaranteed that not only is it going to get worse, but we're now beginning to see, as a few people said, an interaction between them. So climate change and causing climate refugees, causing border problems, causing, you know, we're now getting into not single crises, but multiply layered and complex crises. So we don't have to worry about that one. It's coming, you know, well, there'll always be the next opportunity. Um, in the language of movement building, uh, they call those trigger events. Uh, they say that you have a, a particular tension building and then there's a trigger event that sparks the movement. So we have to be ready for that. So that, that, that was one thought. A second thought, which really alarms me, um, is you know, I, I very much connected within that last chapter, Joseph, you mentioned that the movement needs a positive vision. Um, and I agree, I mean, that's most of what we're talking about, how to better humanity, better the all living beings, et cetera, et cetera. But when I look at the politics right now, and particularly the, uh, the Western nations aligning against Russia uh, and China kind of in the background, um, I mean, the, um, it reminds me more coincidentally of the book we're about to read, Union Now, um, which, is, which at, when the book was written was aligning the Western nations against the Nazis, you know? So it does seem now that there, that there is growing coordination, I mean, as we see in, in what's happened in NATO recently, um, to, to bring, you know, that there's some force there bringing nations together, but toward a negative vision. So that upsets me, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they're, you know, one of the groups that, uh, one of the World Federalist groups now operating mostly out of Australia, Chris Hamer, some of you know him as heading the charge on that, um, looking at a world security community. And I, you know, I, I actually think that proposal will right now in this climate will get more traction. It's very much like the Clarence Strike proposal. Um, but I'm not happy about that. I mean, it's it's building, it's building, it's it's you know, growing stuff, um, but to prepare for war or conflict. So I don't know what to do about that, but I, I want to say that I do see certain forces bringing certain nations together, but with a negative vision. So that that upsets me. The last thing I'll say that I that I've gotten out of your book as a whole is really a greater attunement to the politics and looking for those windows that are out there. Um, to, you know, oh, something has changed now, we could move the needle a little bit. The greatest example right now is the ICC, um, that, you know, all of a sudden is bipartisan support, um, I mean, in, in certain limited ways, uh, but the ICC has become relevant and international law has become relevant. And all of a sudden people are talking about that and, you know, God knows there's, you know, the unanimous resolution by Lindsey Graham, uh, of all people, uh, to aid the ICC in their investigations. So again, it's kind of 
caught in, in this negative vision of being against, you know, a particular party. Um, but, you know, we're now looking at, at getting involved with a campaign to move the ICC forward, ultimately getting U.S. ratification. So, so, so one of the things that I've got is the, actually the importance of looking for political windows where you can move the needle ahead. Another thing is there, you know, a number of international attorneys are working on codifying the crime of ecocide and whether that becomes part of the ICC, the destruct, mass destruction of the environment, ecocide. And, uh, and we're looking at getting involved with that campaign. Um, so and whether that becomes part of the ICC or an independent thing. So I, I, I've, I've gotten a lot more um, awareness of keeping an eye on the politics, not necessarily both eyes, one has to stay on the vision uh, and constantly moving it forward, but also looking at those political opportunities uh, where we can you know, have a little bit of a you know, f start there and move the needle a bit. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I will just say, thank you so much. I've just had a flood of ideas all through the book. Um, and it's like, oh, I've got to put that quote on the website and got to do that. You know, I mean, you've, you've get, given me a long to-do list um, out of your books. So thank you for that and for all the heart you put into these sessions. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Joseph. I see you've been taking notes. Uh, well, yes, I do take notes um, because it's impossible to hold all this in the mind uh, without some reminders. And also, uh, if you take notes, why well, you can um, look at a kind of matrix you know, as you try to um, formulate your response. Of course, uh, there are many thoughts here and I can't do justice to everybody. Um, but I must say, um, I think I'm uh, kind of hard headed. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly interested in practical politics. I uh, wrote this book as a, uh, about the practical politics of uniting humanity. Uh, nothing could be greater than that project, but how do you get there? Is, that's what interests me. And, um, you know, as you were talking, Bob, I, I really think that um, um, that what lies before uh, uh, citizens for global solutions is a, a long struggle. Uh, it might be helpful to to have um, a website with with uh, where you people could express. Um, their visions and their um, so many of the uh, good ideas, world citizenship, world community. Um, but then there has to be a, 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 a political action component. I don't know how long a CGS can survive, but probably what's going to happen uh, is that this war between the West and Russia is going to uh, grow. Uh, Biden, President Biden uh, has uh, openly accepted the challenge to um, struggle against, uh, to uh, lead the democracies in a struggle against the autocracies, Russia and China. Uh, it's just a little bit like the war against fascism in the 40s. Um, and this uh, struggle will overwhelm CGS um, and we could all be swept up, not only in flooding of cities, but in uh, nuclear attacks um, or such an environmental crisis that uh, we can't get food or we can't get electricity. And, uh, I uh, dread the future. I. Um, I, uh, so it's, uh, some people are going to um, enter this struggle and we're going to remake some nations, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, I do think uh, world government will be forgotten for a while, but it, it, 
it, the idea will recur because it's so um, logical and it's really based upon national experience almost everywhere. There are even uh, some 30 federations that have uh, shown the way forward, not just the European Union, Um, I see no leadership for uh, World Federation. I, I don't disagree with Tom Hastings. Um, I see um, uh, I think the main for us uh, in, uh, in the United States, uh, the main struggle is going to be pre to preserve our own democracy. Um, and we're going to, we're, we're going to have an immediate battle um, by the uh, midterms in November. And uh, um, In a way, uh, I mean, uh, what it's, I asked myself, why don't you just give up, Joseph? Um, I, uh, I think, uh, who was it who said he's basically an optimist? Several of you said this. I'm an optimist too. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of foolish. But um, I must say, I, I'm trying to lay low. I mean, I'm just. Um, I'm, um, I want to survive this uh, coming crisis. I, I don't know how really, um, I've made plans to live to, for another 10 years, um, but um, I uh, frankly, I will consider myself fortunate if I get that far. Uh, I think the troubles are, are going to be here in the States, in the United States, then uh, in the, in Europe with the struggle with Russia, um, uh, I I think uh, how not three hundred or six hundred years is the timetable. I would say five hundred years. You know, this is the number that uh, was proposed to Robert M. Hutchins one week after Hiroshima when Hutchins suggested that we had to have world government immediately or else we're gonna be destroyed. And his uh, interlocutor said, but that's 500 years away. I think that's probably about right. So um, everybody, I mean, I, I would love to see a CGS um, survive for a while, but you're gonna be overtaken by money, the need for money, by the need for uh, 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 of um, prestigious leadership, um, by the need for people who can actually do things, uh, a professional group who, uh, the only one here who's actually on the payroll is Bob and D Drea, I think, maybe one or two others, but, but uh, you know, in the 80s, I, I got my PhD in 1982 and I, I couldn't get a good job. And so finally I, I but I did stick around with the World Federalist Movement <coughs> and there was an opening in New York for the World Federalist Movement office. Um, and um, there was no guaranteed salary but it was such an opportunity to work near the United Nations that I took this job. Eventually I was financially ruined and I have never forgotten the mistake I made, but I happened to arrive in 1985 when Mikhail Gorbachev had come to power. And suddenly there I was uh, in New York City at the United Nations and there was a creative statesman uh, in the Soviet Union who was leading the whole world out of the Cold War. That was the most powerful opportunity I've ever had in my life. I was part of that. So somebody here, uh, if you're like me and an optimist and a little foolish, you might uh, just grab an opportunity to do this. 
um, go for some organization that really might make a difference and um, get yourself in place where where you can get paid and um, let and uh, devote yourself to the uh, some cause. I would recommend that people, I, I really think that um, uh, CGS needs to have a, a publication arm. So does the WFM. Uh, I don't see it forming, but it, it you know, you, you, no great movement has ever succeeded without a journal. Lenin had Iskra and uh, the suffragists had uh, revolution. Um, if you had a little, if you had, maybe nowadays it would be a website because <clears throat> people don't read anymore. So, oh, do this on the internet as long as it lasts before it's hacked to death. Um, but but um, you, need to, you need to get your thoughts on, I was going to say on paper, get them on on the web. Uh, fight this uh, battle on the, in the medium that is now available to us. I have become eloquent on paper. I have learned to be a. I consider myself a literary artist, but nobody reads anymore. And. Uh, it's the people who do drama, do YouTube, uh, who are, are communicating. Um, that's the new medium, it's not print. So anyway, I'm gonna bid you all a bon voyage and a farewell. It's been a, a help for me to uh, meet with you six times. Um, You've given my book the most thorough uh, reading that um, I've ever experienced. I uh, hope it helped you. I'm not gonna write another. Um, try to um, look for those new opportunities, get yourself into a position where you can devote yourself to this cause in some way. Um, expect uh, almost uh, expect almost uh, complete failure, but at least you'll be, you know, lighting a candle instead of cursing the darkness. Goodbye. Joseph, before you leave, I, I'd like to um, respond to some organizational points that, that you raised just for you and everybody else to know since you brought them up. Um, first, we are hiring. We actually hired someone yesterday um, and, and we have one or two other positions we're hiring for. Um, they have to do right now in the area of development, uh, membership, um, membership growth and marketing. Um, so we, we do have positions, we are hiring. Second, as far as a journal is concerned, we actually have a journal we do in, in cooperation with the World Federalist Movement Canada. It's called Mondial. It's available both online at our website and in hard copy. We have a newsletter that comes out monthly. Um, we have an op-ed team that sends out op-eds that we write. We've, we've had hundreds of placements so far in small and medium size um, media outlets. Um, we have a social media team that's gearing up right now to get things out through social media, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And we're starting to move in the video direction. Uh, we, we are acquiring 25 videos right now uh, that are being finished around World Federation issues um, by another World Federalist group that we've helped fund. Um, and we're lo also looking at moving into video in a bigger way because you're right, that's what people are looking at these days. So I just wanted to make those points uh, that, so that people know that. So I, I, at, at this time,
time. And Joseph, if you're, you know, if you're free, we can do our usual debriefing after. I don't know if you had a run or not. Um, but let me open the floor for any now announcements that people might have about things that they are promoting or want us to know about. And then after we hear from the group, we'll have Gail and me, Andrea, talk about the next book and all that. So first, anything, any announcements other than book club announcements? Donna, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm not sure it's an announcement or an addition to what you were saying, okay. but um, to be clear for everyone, Citizens for Global Solutions is the U.S. Uh, member organization of the World Federalist Movement. And um, right now, Bob is leading a group of that World Federalist Movement made up of, of member organizations and associate organizations from all over the world. Uh, we're developing a theory of change, a vision and a mission. So just I mean, like, although Citizens for Global Solution is the U.S. member focused on the U.S. Uh, people, um, uh, we are part of that larger movement, just in case people here don't know that. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and we're also working for better coordination between all the national organizations than, frankly, we've had certainly in the last few decades. Um, I see Barat, and then I see uh, Ron Glossop's hand. Barat? Well, I just have a, a, a request for Professor Barata. Um, would it be okay to be in touch with you? Uh, there are questions and issues that come up and I think you might provide uh, uh, with your experience, uh, good counsel. Uh, you may not have the answers, but you will certainly have uh, insights that would be helpful. So can we, uh, 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 you know, can we continue to maintain connections with you and not say goodbye for good? <laughs> Let me um, uh, respond immediately. Uh, and, I, and this goes to everybody. Uh, I like being a counselor. Uh, I'd like to be a, like Grenville Clark, maybe a, a statesman incognito. Um, I uh, know things, and um, I, I uh, like to respond to people, uh, and I write careful letters. Um, my uh, my uh, email address is Joseph Barata at Mac, M -A -C, dot com. Mac is short for Macintosh. I'm a Macintosh person. Um, Joseph Barata at mac.com um please do write and uh, tell all your friends um i um have pretty good judgment and i know things so um although i'm just an old codger you know puttering around in the garden <clears throat> okay and, and just to point out, if you're not looking at the chat, uh, Melanie put Joseph's uh, email address in the chat. So you have it there as well. Um, so again, these are our calls for announcements um, or th events or things that you're promoting. Um, so I see Alami next. Yeah, um, just to mention that there is a global movement coming up, which is called Effective Altruism which uses reason and evidence to you know, promote or do the most good. So globally, we are pressing some you know, issues that, like global governance, existential risk, and long-termism. And I believe this with the Center for Effective Altruism, CDS can you know, collaborate and you know, work together to promote the visions of the, you know, of CDS, I believe. So, so that Center for Effective Altruism, if you put that in the, um, in the chat, that would be helpful. Sure, I'll do that. Great, thank you. Virginia? I'd just like to build on what Donna said about the theory of change uh, that I'm part of and others are um, to actually address the concerns that Joseph raised in his book about this movement. We are addressing it in, in totally looking at a new, a new way of being together that is very transparent, very uh, accountable, and we still have the same goal of abolishing war. 
no, it's, it's, there are ways to transform our institutions and our movements. So I just wanna give a big thank you to Bob Flax who's organizing that. And it's a, very inspiring for me to be part of it. Great, thank you, Virginia. Ron. I just want to mention that although there's a lot of pessimism, there is room for optimism and UNESCO, UNESCO has now decided to publish its monthly publication in Esperanto. The movement is led by a Chinese gentleman who is an Esperantist. And so I think that everything is not negative. There are some progress, there's some progress going on in UNESCO. Good. Thank you, Ron. Any other announcements or things people are promoting? Simon? Uh, I've been uh, involved in a world movement that was successful, namely the WHO, the World Health Organization, for the first time in its history, 1967 to 77, worked to eradicate smallpox in the world successfully. It took 10 years, not 500 years, 10 years to vaccinate everybody with the vaccine that I helped to make in London University. And the last case of smallpox was in 1977 in Somalia, East Africa, in a young male cook who had been vaccinated with a mild disease and survived. Before that, smallpox infected 15 million people each year, killing five, 5 million each year. So since 77, zero cases of smallpox. And uh, we have, we are, saving 5 million lives each year from smallpox. I've also been involved in research as a graduate of Oxford, and I'm a graduate of Harvard. I have doctorates and honorary doctorates, and we are saving another 5 million lives each year, 10 million lives each year. So I had experience of leadership, teaching, mentorships, coaching, and collaboration. And I would urge you to work with me to extend the the European Union, which is successful, into a world union, which will also be successful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. Um, other announcements that people are promoting things? Melanie. Yes, just a real quick, our great success getting out on Link TV with the film, The World is My Country. Um, amazing, 31 million viewers and we put out a social media campaign excitement all this great stuff we've got a gofundme go going for reaching out actually to uh, public tv stations all over the world we're starting with south africa so we have contact there we're working that out um, and also we're going to be working with Massachusetts Peace Action, where they're going to be showing the, the, our film to their group, and then we're going to have a discussion and showing clips from the film. That, that is the 22nd of June. So very exciting news going forward. And uh, yes, um, very important to stay in action, do something, do something you like, and, and keep going. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands on announcements, so I will just go right into our next book. I'll say a few words, and then if Gail or Drea, who have also been working on securing the author, um, want to add, that'd be terrific. Um, so the, ne the next book, which Joseph actually has mentioned in past sessions, is called, I think this session too, uh, called Union Now uh, by Clarence Streit. And, and Clarence is no longer with us. He is deceased. Um, but he left an organization behind him called the Strike Council. And we have the executive director of the Strike Council who will be our guest, uh, guest presenter. Her name is Tiziana Stella. Um, I believe she's Italian, but is living in the United States, I think in Washington, DC. And she is happy to speak with us. She will be with us for the first three of the five sessions, she her schedule doesn't permit uh, her to be with us for all of them, but she will be with us for the first three. And in addition to the book, she has a number of articles that she's written, and I believe she's going to share with us one article for, for each of the first three sessions. So we'll have a chance to look at the book and her writings, which update the ideas in the book. Um, as was mentioned uh, before, is that most of the proposals about World Federation came after World War II. 
Um, but Union Now is an exception where it came before World War II, and the idea was to head off World War II uh, by creating that federation of democratic nations. Um, so, so that's that's basically the, the you know what what we'll be presenting. We have a month off, so we have no we do not have a session in July, um, and we. Um, an email was sent out about the fact that in addition to the scheduling uh, that I mentioned that you could just come with us for the three, those first three sessions will also be starting later, again, to accommodate her schedule. Um, either Gail or Drea, I know you were working out that negotiation. Can you give a little more specifics on that? The time period that she's available um, is going to be from 2.30 until 4 p.m. for those first three sessions. So August, September, and October, that's the time change. Um, I know Gal's really good at sending out reminders and things, so we'll make sure that that schedule is sent out in writing. Uh, but again, August, September, October, we have that time change from 2.30 Eastern Standard Time until 4 p.m. Great. Great, and Gail, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I just wanted to remind people that we won't meet next month, August 13, but um, I mean, July. <laughs> you won't meet in July, but the next time we'll meet is August 13, which is the second Saturday of the month. Great. But at and a different time, as Drea mentioned, which, um, you know, we need to keep in mind also. Yes, and that will all be emailed out as well. Um, let me say that, um, let me say a few words about the next book after that. Um, since both the current book we just completed with Joseph and Union Now are both historical works or focused on history, um, we would like to have the book following those two be more of a contemporary nature. So we are in the process right now of screening books um, on world federation and world citizenship that more, more speak to current times um, and we can, where we can also secure the author. So we're in the middle of doing that now. If you have any suggestions um, or recommendations, you can send those to outreach at globalsolutions.org. Again, that's outreach at globalsolutions.org. Um, we have a few in mind. We, we, there, there are some folks that are overseas, but due to the time difference, the time zones, we, we're not going to go ahead with them. So we're going to try to do another book where uh, we have the author live. Um, but again, I know we've all been spoiled. We've had a run of books with authors after we had a number where we didn't have the authors. So we may, from time to time, be, be reading a book where the author is not available. Um, so that could happen again in the future, even though I know we've all been spoiled uh, because of how much more wonderful it is when the author is with us. So, so with that, um, that completes um, uh, the announcements that I have. Uh, Drea or, or Gail, anything from either of you to wrap up for today? Okay, last thing I'll say is if you appreciated this and uh, wanna see us keep going um, to renew your membership, if you haven't already, just go to globalsolutions.org, um, click on either it says donate or be a member or something uh, to renew your membership. And we do take donations beyond that. We're always happy to receive support. So with that, I'll bid you all a um, farewell for now. See you in two months at our next session. And- So Bob, are yeah. uh, you gonna stay on? Yes, yes, I was just gonna say Gail, Drea, Joseph, if you can stay on another moment, we'll wrap up. See you again. Bye. And decide whether you want to record it or, or not. Oh, very good. I'll uh, thank you for the reminder. I'll stop the recording now. Thanks, everybody.